but they line up all night. These are like up to 100 ton blocks, 200 ton blocks, all stacked on top of each other. No problem. Those guys were supposed to not even have the pulley. They didn't have the wheel. They didn't have iron tools. Only copper. Copper does not cut rock. And on some of these blocks, there's no writing whatsoever in there. But in some of these blocks is this symbol. And these symbols are very strange. Because they're not cut. They're not etched. They're not carved into the stone. They are burnt into the stone like if they were burnt by a laser. So now you have ancient, ancient walls, 5,000 years old at least, walls that have burnt geometry in them, laser burnt geometry in them. You don't expect that from these ancient civilizations. Here's a close-up of this. Actually, now these pictures are more popular, but when I was researching this, it was extremely difficult to get those pictures. I actually had to send people over there to take the pictures. And this um, reason for uh, not being able to find these pictures e easily is because the archaeological community doesn't know what to do with this. So, in general, they ignored it. But if you take that geometry and you make it 3D so that each circle is a sphere, well, guess what? you get 64 tetrahedron structure when you put the fundamental geometry of the vacuum in it. So where was that temple? That temple is called the Azarian Temple and in Abydos. And it's behind Seti II Temple, I believe. And it's actually where the fundamental myth of creation, uh, uh, the fundamental myth of the Egyptian mummification comes from. It's the temple of Oz Osiris, where the wife of Osiris, Isis, supposedly revived Osiris with her magic. You have to understand that the technology I'm talking about, if you tap into the fundamental structure of creation, if you tap into the fundamental structure of space, you will start to be able to tap into the life force of creation. You can start doing things like being able to keep your biological system going because you can continuously feed back more information. You can, uh, you can keep uh, recharging your system so that it doesn't run down. Because now you have access to the structure of space-time. Most people don't know, but there's pyramids in China. Those are actually Chinese pyramid. They're very large, you can see. And when you look at the Chinese pyramid, this is the pyramids uh, in Giza. This is Titi Nakan, the sun pyramid, the moon pyramid, and another one there, at the, the way of the dead. They all lined up nicely in the same way. And that lineup is the same lineup that you find 
for the belt of Orion. This is the stars of the belt of Orion. Now these things are worlds apart. You think that's a coincidence? Never mind the fact that all of these people, all of these ancient civilizations have told us that all of their knowledge didn't come from them, that it came from sun gods, people that came from the stars, and most of them identify that the source of these sun gods as the Orion constellation. So, this is almost a direct map to what happened. Now, I already showed you the yin yang. The I Ching is 64 exagrams, right? And it's, um, it's each hexagram has six sticks, and there's a broken stick, and there is a full stick. And if you cross the two, you get an X structure. Now, if you duplicate this X, right, so that you're using all the sticks in the symbols of the each in, then you can map it. And really, all you're doing is following the mapping that the I Ching gives you to produce the geometry of the vacuum. All you're doing is taking the number one, number 64, and following the map that the I Ching give you, and you get all of this geometry coming together. And that combined with the yin yang that I showed you, the two together gives you all the map of the structure of the vacuum and the dynamics of the toroidal field. So, let's see. And then you go to the city of the sun gods, right? The forbidden city. And the city of the sun gods is guarded in front by the sphinx. In the ancient Chinese tradition is the Fu Dog. And the Fu Dog guards, just like the tradition of the Sphinx, the knowledge is guarded by the Fu Dog or the Sphinx under its paw. It guards the knowledge. And what do you find under the paw? Again, the geometry of the vacuum, this intersection of the tetrahedron array, the guardian of the knowledge. Is there remains of these individuals? Is there remains of these society around the world? Is there information that says, yes, these sun gods were really here, that they were interacting with these people out there? Well, I believe there is. These are skulls that were found in South America. They're very elongated. I call them cone heads. <laughs> They're not your average, you know, skull. 
all around the world from the Egyptian, the Mayans, the Incas, the ancient Indian, North American Indian in, in, uh, in America. They all had this uh, strange um, behavior, this strange culture where they would bend the head of the children to try to deform them. And in their tradition, it was said that they would do this to make them sun gods. They were trying to imitate something. How did they do that? Well, when the child was growing, they would tighten the band harder and harder. In some cases, they would put um, wood planks in the banding to push on the forehead to deform it. But you know, when you do that to a child, the volume of the brain, the volume of the brain cavity inside the skull does not change. It's the same volume. But in some cases, in these skulls, the volume is almost twice the human brain. So, it's very interesting. Now, there wasn't just one of those skulls found. Many of these skulls were found. Most of the time, very close to very sacred sites, like in temples and so on. They had different kinds, more pointy, less pointy. Here is the normal skull of a human, and this is the elongated skull. And now, uh, can we have sound on the computer? You see, before they were found only in... Let's see, let me make sure. We have sound on the computer? Um, um, you know, before these skulls were only found in South America or in, around Mexico, now they're starting to find them all sorts of different places. I think one was found in France. And this one, these ones were found in Siberia, in the middle of Russia. Actually, northern Russia. Unusual skulls, I would say so. Это группа людей, которые представляли собой, скажем так, живой прибор, определяющий наличие, например, опасности, или могли делать метеопрогноз. It's uncertain how they got those, right? So, you know, these skulls are found now in northern Russia. It's very unusual. France, there's other skulls that were found in Mexico that look quite different. Now, this one was found in South America. The, I got this from my friend um, Klaus Donner, which is, has done this exhibit 
of unusual objects that have been found all around the world. The first exhibit occurred in Vienna. We're trying to get it to come to the United States as well. But he showed me this skull. This is from South America. I think it's in a private collection. Note here that the bone at the top of the skull is one piece, right? It's completely one piece. Now, this cannot be a human skull because our top bones are two pieces. So that is very telling. You have a completely different uh, physiology. This is a very unusual skull. It actually has a larger volume than the cone head skull. This is actually the largest one ever found. You can see the hemispheres were quite separated. Oh. Let's see. Um. Oh, it's, it's the next slide. Um, just a second. Look at this one. This is called a star child. And uh, interestingly, in this one, um, there was tests that were done. I've been waiting for a long time. For years, I've been looking at these ancient, uh, you know, um, skulls, uh, wondering when are we going to get good DNA testing done. It's taken a long time because it's very difficult to get the people that own the skulls or to get the, the curators of the museum to allow for DNA testing and all this. So finally, DNA testing was done independently. And here is the result. Ah. Oh. <laughs> um, you mind if I pull out the file? Um, let's see. We need sound on the computer. On possibly the strangest looking skull ever discovered. Okay, let me start it over. In early 2010, a team of geneticists in America began DNA testing on possibly the strangest looking skull ever discovered. Whilst trying to recover its nuclear DNA and matching it against the National Institute of Health database, they found a significant number of coherent base pairs that have never been seen before. This was an historic moment for science, as it proved beyond all reasonable doubt that part of the skull's DNA is not human. Since that result, the geneticists have predicted that when the final genome recovery is complete, it will provide science with the first record of alien DNA ever discovered. The skull's caretaker is Lloyd Pye. Lloyd, a researcher in aspects of human origins, named it the Star Child. It was found in Mexico in the 1930s, and through carbon dating, we know that the skull is over 900 years old. It has over two dozen major physiological differences to that of a human. These are the cuts in the skulls for DNA testing, and you see that the star child, when I've been saying it's half as thick, you see very clearly here, in some points it's even less than half. And this is, you know, in the skull. So, I mean, there's just no exaggeration there. There's a complete difference in the bone throughout, uniformly, it's different. This is the biochemistry of a typical human bone. Its calcium and phosphorus levels are high, and its oxygen and carbon levels are low. But with the star child, it's quite different. The phosphorus is down, and the carbon and oxygen are up, indicating its biochemistry is more like tooth enamel than regular bone. 
This is uh, a uh, scanning electron microscope view of the bone and this is the way bone is created. You have the cortical layer here, cortical layer here and in here are the cancellous holes where the bone marrow moves. And coming out of um, some of the cancellous holes but also embedded in the matrix of the bone are these, these fibers, these very durable strange fibers that nobody's ever seen before, they're in no other species and we don't really know what they are but we just know that they're really durable because the Dremel blade that cut this through here did not cut cleanly these these different fibers. That tells you they have a high high resistance factor to the blade. It lacks frontal sinuses, has smaller chewing muscles and is missing an inion. Instead its neck connects on top of its frame and magnum opening indicating that its neck is about half the size of a normal human neck. And here we see one clearly embedded in the matrix of the bone on the surface. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. And you know what science says about this? Ah, you probably dropped it on a carpet and it picked up carpet fibers. You know, just, I mean, really, that is the answer that I get. It has to be just fibers off a carpet or something. This can't be, it really can't be in the world of, of mainstream science, but there it is. This is a piece of upper right maxilla that was found with the star child. When one of the teeth was extracted, it was found to have very heavy roots, indicating it was an adult when it died. When the maxilla was x-rayed, a staggering five more teeth were discovered, waiting to come down. The key is that normal human bone, when you die, there are bacteria in your body that scour and eat every bit of your marrow out and they leave your bone polished, shining, just like this, just like you see. You could eat out of that just like the bacteria did. It's so clean. There is no marrow left anywhere. And this is the way it is with all animals when they die. With a star child, we see a big difference. And we also see a difference in the color too. It's much more milkier than that alabaster look of the human bone because it's got so much more collagen. But you see this red residue here sprinkled everywhere. We don't know what that is. Never seen it before and it's not in any other species. It's not blood because when blood oxidizes, it's not our blood anyway or our type blood because when blood oxidizes it turns black. So if that was bone marrow that would, that would be black. So those two things, the, the fibers and the, um, and the um, residue are just unknown in anything else and here they sit in the star child, both of them, and yet science just says, you know, and this is what they say. This is what you need to understand about science and all of these physiological differences that I've just pointed out, they mean nothing to mainstream science. They mean nothing. In January of this year, a geneticist contacted me out of the blue and he said, I think you really might have something. And he said, if you send me a sample, I will take a new technique, a new shotgunning technique, which recovers much smaller pieces than the old uh, primer technique. So he took it. About six weeks later, he got back in touch with me and he says, you're really not going to believe what what's happening here. Uh, we, we don't, I don't believe it. I've done it enough times now to where I'm convinced that I'm doing it right and we're getting some very unusual results. Some of it comes out human, sure enough. You see right here, this sequence of 265 base pairs long, 265, no question about it, part of the star child is human. So this is a really important part. This is why I'm playing this video for you except, next slide, some of the star child's DNA comes back with this incredible reading. No significant similarity found. 342 base pairs long. It's a coherent base pair sequence not found in the NIH database. I said, well, how, what's the answer? And he says, well, it could be, and here's where we go off the deep end, it could be that it's an alien, entirely an alien, born to a human mother. And I said, what? How would that happen? How would you get a pure alien born to a human mother? So he made up a slide for me and sent it to me. And he said, now understand, this is happening today. This is happening today. If a human female has mitochondrial disease, which means that her mitochondria are bad and are going to produce very, very flawed 
and dead children for the most part. If it's found out that she has that and she wants to have a, a child with her mate, her husband, what they can do is they can take her package, put it in a dish, you've heard about this, and mix it with her husband's sperm and create a zygote with her chromosome package and her husband's chromosome package. Then they take an egg, a good egg, from a third party, a third a woman, take that woman's chromosomal package out, put the zygote in, put that egg in the first woman, and she will have a baby that will be her and her husband's genes, but it will have the mitochondria of the third woman. So he said we could have the same thing. You have two aliens getting together, making a zygote, and for whatever reason, taking the, uh, the chromosomal package out of a female egg, putting it in, and then she will bring it to term, and it's a full alien, nothing but alien DNA in it, but it has her mitochondrial human mitochondrial DNA. Now, why? Why would they do that? We don't have any idea. We know this is a radical thing to say. We know that it's going to be met with a lot of resistance because it's going to prove that we don't just have a, a, a hybrid between a human and an alien 900 years ago. We have genetic, clear genetic engineering, clear evidence of genetic engineering 900 years ago. It's a much bigger pill for science to swallow, and it's also going to cause a much bigger revolution in thinking among everybody because we're, it's going to be very hard to wrap minds around this. But this is where we are. This is what we think we can do. This is what we know we can do. We're now in the process of trying to get the money to start the process of sequencing the whole genome because when you sequence the genome, at the end of that period, it's only about three to four months. From the time you start, three to four months, you have an answer. And you have a general idea of what that percentage is going to be, whether it's 15 percent, 20 percent, whatever. You can do it within, say, five points of error, just recovering the whole genome. And then you have the period of eight to 12 months. Where you guys get the idea? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's very significant. And uh, I'm working with uh, Klaus Donor, which has access to these other skulls that were found to start sequencing some of the DNA of the other skulls as well. Well, in these ancient civilization all over the place is that fundamental creation myth where the sun gods have children with the women of man. It's, I think, even in the Bible, right? Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's in Genesis 6 chapter. And, uh, and the sons of God came to the earth and found the women of man pretty, or something along those lines, <laughs> and had children with them. Now, I would like to say that what's really, the, the reason I played that video to its end is that in this uh, discovery that was done from this skull, you can actually see, you can actually prove that there was DNA engineering manipulation that occurred. So, you know, it's most likely not like the sun gods had intercourse with women of men, but that they might have been, you know, gene, DNA engineering to produce, you know, the, those results. These are physical evidence of this ancient, very powerful myth of these sun gods being here. And this is, might be why so many of the ancient knowledge talks about very specific geometries, very specific temple building, very specific set of information that may be crucial for us at this time. I think one of the most remarkable 
uh, evidence of these people. You see, because if this information has to do with the structure of the vacuum, if this information has to do with this technology, with this technology that can tap the structure of creation, that can tap, that can produce gravitational field, then you would see things like this, where huge rocks were transported. Look at the size of this thing. I think it's, it's like a thousand ton. This is in the quarry where it was cut, you know? Imagine trying to lift something like that. And then it's, it's stacked, you know, on top of each other. I mean, look, this is the quarry over there. The Romans built a temple on top of it. They used that. It's like, wow, look at those big rocks. Hey, they started something. We'll just finish it with one of our temples, right? So, you know, they built a temple on top of it, but you see, they were moved. This is a, approximately a mile away. Now, a mile is not necessarily a long distance unless you're carrying a thousand-ton block, you know? So... Um, and so then you look at the ancient text and you look at the ancient information, you start to realize, and this is what happened, happened to me when I was doing the research, I started to realize, wait a minute, if these sun gods were really here from advanced civilization, they, might, they left us really important information about the structure of creation. And there you see it, for instance, in this, you know, Babylonian tablets, some of the most ancient knowledge on the planet, you know, from coming from the Sumerians. Look here, the singularity with the boundary of the event horizon, right? And the geometry, the evolution of the geometry structure, the division of the structure of space-time. If you look closely, you can start to recognize this. I did because I was used to looking at the 64 tetrahedron grid. When you rotate the 64 tetrahedron grid on its side, guess what? You got this exact same mapping. So they were telling us about this. They were telling us about this so we would have it on time because these ancient people they didn't just tell us about the information, they, give, they even give us calendars, right? Saying, oh, by the way, here's the knowledge and here's the calendar on how long you got before you got to have this figured, right? These calendars are most known as the, ca the Mayan calendars. Here is in the uh, uh, Islamic tradition. This is the Kaaba at the center of Mecca. In there is supposed to be the power at the center of the, um, of the, um, um, of the, of the faith, uh, at the center of the power uh, of the Quran, right? It's the is the creation stone. It, it was called the black stone or the black crystal. In the Quran, it says to have been given to man by angel Gabriel. Um, and, you know, it's supposed to be in the center of the Kaaba. Now, archaeologists have said that that black stone is most likely um, meteorite that was found by a Bedouin in the desert. I assure you that you don't start the largest religion on earth because you found a black stone in the desert. This crystal, this fundamental crystal structure, 
we'll see a little later on, may have been this power source that was described in many different civilizations. Did you all know about this in Turkey? They found this ancient city in Turkey that is 11 to 13,000 years old. You know, 11 to 13,000 years ago, we were supposed to be hunters and gatherers. We, we were like basically just out of caves. And they found this city that has these huge rocks, these huge pillars that was sustaining most likely quite an elaborate roof system. And around them, they found all sorts of arrows from the hunters and the gatherers. From 12, 13,000 years ago. But I assure you that they didn't do all this, the hunters and the gatherers. Where did it come from? So this leads us, just before the break, we'll break at six. This leads us to the, um, to the end of the ancient civilization part. I want to kind of talk quickly about this. This is the part with the Hebraic tradition, the, you know, Old Testament tradition. When I, when I was studying all these ancient civilizations, I kept the Bible for the end because, you know, having been brought up in Catholic church and Catholic schools, um, I had kind of an allergic reaction to the whole thing. And so I was not so keen on studying the Bible. And, uh, but when I actually finally picked it up again, uh, you know, to start to study it, I, uh, I started to study the Old Testament. And I started to realize something. It's like, wait, the Old Testament talks about some object, when it says the word God, it's talking about an object. It's talking about something. They're calling the, the covenant of God or the ark of the covenant of God or the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it represents that object, it doesn't show an old man with a beard and you know, a pair of binoculars and a baseball bat. It doesn't. When it talks about that, it shows like a tetrahedron sitting on a throne <laughs> as the representation of God. And then it describes it as like God was the crystal sea It was called the Ark of the Covenant of God. It was this incredible object that had all sorts of power. It was able to do all sorts of things. For instance, it was said that it would radiate, and if you weren't, if you didn't cover your face, you would get sunburned. Right? And it was said that it would create a phenomenon that was called a pillar of light or a pillar of cloud about it, above it, like a big vortex. Aha. Uh -huh. Now I was getting interested. I liked the Bible all of a sudden. <laughs> I was, uh, because, you know, all through the research, as I started to elaborate how you would build this technology, I realized that crystalline structures would be very important 
And I realized you would have to spin the field very, very fast to start to get the singularity to be produced. Basically, you got to reproduce those fundamental dynamics of the double torus for it to occur. For the singularity to occur, it would produce a vortex in space-time. And it's exactly what they would describe. This is what they call the tabernacle, where they would put the ark while they were going through the desert uh, for 40 years. And when you read, you know, the Bible, and if you read the Torah, that describes this movement of the, um, of the Ark of the Covenant through the desert, it talks about things like the Ark would move on its own. You know this desert? took only six months to travel this desert for all the Bedouins at the time. It took 40 years for the tribes of Israel to do it because they were following the ark. And, the, and it says that the ark would go on its own. And then where it would stop, they would stop. And sometimes it would stay there for years. And so they camped there for years until it would go again. And then they would follow it again. This is, you know, some of the things that... My grandfather did. My grandfather was a Bedouin. He brought people to Mecca, where another one of those crystals might have been. Actually, I think that the two were very much related, the Ark of the Covenant and the, um, and the Kaaba. My grandfather was a Bedouin that brought people from Iran to Mecca because in those traditions, everybody's got to go to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. And if they can't make it, they have to send somebody with their prayer to Mecca. And they got to turn around the Kaaba seven times with that prayer. So my grandfather was in charge of bringing all the prayers of the people that couldn't go. And then so he would, he would guide the people that could go and bring the prayer, prayers of the ones that couldn't go. And it would take six months on Camelback to go there and six months to come back. And I have an article, my father has an article uh, from the Tehran Press when my grandfather died. He was thought to be the oldest man on earth. He died at the age of 128 years old. Why did he die so old? I think it's because he went and spun around that crystal for a very long time. Because remember, and we're going to see this after the break, if you have a technology that's tapping into the source of, cre of life, the source of the organization of all things, now when you hang around that technology, there's a good chance you're going to live longer. And in the Old Testament, in Genesis, they keep insisting on the age of people. You know, they tell you, and so-and-so was 735 years old and had 325 children. Dude, I have two, and I'm like overwhelmed. <laughs> Holy schmoly. You know? And, uh, you know, and so-and-so lived 800 years, and so-and-so. And, and, you know, the ancient Egyptian talked about the, mo the moment of initiation when the initiate would go and in front of this power, and they would come out of the temple as semi-god and live forever. And so on. So, you know, this all started to sound similar and then when you looked at the word God in the Bible, if you actually look at where that word is translated from, it's translated from the Greek, the tetragrammaton. This is actually at the forefront of your Bible in the preface. If you look carefully, it says the word God is taken from the word tetragrammaton. 
Tetragrammaton, folks. Every time you see the word God in the Bible, you can say tetragrammaton. So when you go, oh my tetragrammaton? <laughs> now you say, and for a guy like me that's doing my research, when I see the word tetra, you know, I, uh, you know, I clue in, right? So tetra is four in Greek. And grammaton has been translated as grammar. So the four letters of God. Here's the four letters of God. The tetragrammaton. And they're in the Kabbalistic tradition, they're typically arranged like this in a triangle shape. And it, you know, that is a good representation of the isotropic vector metric, which is... You know, one face of it is four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. And, you know, this grammaton part of the word has two roots. Four letters of God, so it has the root grammar for letter. But as well, it has another root, which is the source for the word gravity. It represents grams of, or weight. So all of a sudden, you have a tetrahedron, a tetra, that has gravity for the word of God in the Bible. Okay? Most of you have read the Bible, right? It's, no? No. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so, it's very remarkable, though. It starts to give you another understanding of why there might have been a distortion of our understanding of creation. The ancient might have been talking about geometry and technology, physical thing, and then it's got all mixed up into you know, dogma. And when you, each letter has a number, and when you add the numbers together, you get 72, which is found in the Bible everywhere, the 72 faces of God, or the 72 um, names of God. But you see, this is only the male tetrahedron again. It's only the male approach to God again. If we have another one of these that come together, now we double this number. 72 plus 72 is what? 144. 144 is found in the Bible in Revelation, where it says, and the crystal city of the ark will come back to the earth, right? And it has, a, it has a faces of 144 crystals or something along those lines. Well, Oh, the part I forgot to tell you is that if you take 64 tetrahedrons and you count the amount of faces on the outside, you get 144 faces. And then they tell you, if you decode this geometry, which is called the tree of knowledge, the Kabbalistic tree, which relates to the tree of knowledge that's found in the Garden of Eden. Notice that many of these ancient civilizations talks about the time of revelation, the time where we're going to understand all of the mysteries that we hadn't understood before and that we are going to ascend. When they tell us we're going to ascend, Maybe they didn't just mean spiritually, but actually they meant literally. 
we are going to ascend. Right? When they tell us this, they say to us that this moment, this transformation is going to come from this understanding of the fundamental geometry of knowledge, the tree of knowledge. That if we can decode this, we will understand the principles of the universe, the mystery of all mysteries. But then they give you a warning. They say, many have tried, and most have gone crazy. I, when I came across that, I thought, well, you know, most people think I'm crazy already. So it's not going to make much of a difference. <laughs> so I thought, wait, you know, I got to figure this out. And I, I, I drew the whole thing, and I was in my van still, and I... I uh, I plastered it on the ceiling of my van above my bed so I could wake up and look at it and try to figure it out. And so I, uh, you know, I looked at it. Oh, by the way, as well, this is related, the tree of knowledge is related to the tree that's described in Genesis as the, the tree with the apple thing, you know, the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden which the ancient civilization tells us that when we're going to ascend, the earth will regain its state of garden. Well, that would mean that we literally ascend, not just spiritually, because if it, the earth goes back to a state of garden, that's because we took all the cement off, because we're not on it anymore. Right? So... You know, I was thinking about this, and it, you know, this tree of knowledge as well in the ancient, uh, in the um, in the, Gene the book of Genesis is an uh, apple tree, right? And the apple is like the knowledge. And so, all of a sudden, I realized, wait, and I grabbed an apple and I cut it in half, and if you look at half an apple, you realize you've got a double torus, okay? With the seed in the middle, and the, each seed contains the potential of infinite amount of apples, because each seed can make the tree that makes apples, that makes trees, that makes apples, and so on. So, you know, this amazing thing was coming together. I was really liking the Bible all of a sudden. And so I, I start to look at this, and I realize that obviously you have a tetrahedron on the bottom, and that on the top you have an octahedron, which is the two geometry you need to build the 64 tetrahedron grid. But I couldn't figure out this part here. So I eventually realized that if I took the top part, and I slid the bottom part into the top part, all of a sudden, it became a three-dimensional object. And all the vectors were there to produce the eight-star tetrahedron. So all the information was there. And then it was said in the Kabbalistic tradition that there is not only... Uh, one tree, but that there's four trees of knowledge that are connected at the root, and that they are they have a mirror function. So there's not four; they can be eight if they're mirrored, if they're polarized. So if eight of these trees come together and they decode to eight star tetrahedron, then you get the 64 tetrahedron grid right out of it. And how do you know you've done it right? Because by the time you finish, you can plaster the, 
Kabbalistic tree right back on it. You've got a full loop. And you can actually array it right around. So I don't know if I've gone crazy, but it seems to be correct. There's much more details to this structure. Uh, you can actually uh, flip the trees around and get all the other tetrahedrons. And, and, and if you follow the actual Kabbalistic tradition, the, the roots become the crown and the crown becomes the root. And the whole object of the decoding of the tree is to find this Singularity, this point of infinite density that's at the, the heart of the Kabbalistic tradition is the heart of God, the point of infinite potential. I mean, this is like literally describing everything I was describing to you in physics earlier on. And so a lot of this information is uncovering now. It's coming out. We are literally at that moment in history where we are recovering the information and we have the knowledge base in science now to apply it and to apply it to our external world so that we can transform our world, transform our technology and ascend. Are we gonna make that step? <laughs> you and me together, we will make that change. It's coming. It's a storm that's brewing that cannot be stopped. But, and we have a limited amount of time. There is changes that are occurring in our world that are going to have consequences on our capacity to move forward. We have to make that transition. We're very, very close. We need every one of you every one of you to become aware of the information, to take the time every day to connect with your vacuum self, to connect with your infinite potential, because in that point of infinite potential is your true essence, is your mastery. Every one of you is a master. You hold that within yourself, all knowledge. And I actually mathematically proved it to you today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we're going to take a little break, and after the break, we're going to do another hour to hour and a half where I'm going to talk about what was done in laboratory, which I usually don't talk about in public. And after this, we'll have questions and answers. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.